Hey everybody, Fabio back once again with yet another edition of my Horror Movie Month. And now I'm actually going to talk about Phantasm 2, The Ball is Back. And yes, I do have the VHS. I do have it on DVD as a matter of fact. I have the uh, Phantasm Sphere from uh, England, the UK Region 2 release, which is a great release. If you have a Region Free player or a computer that has a DVD ROM drive, pick it up. It's, at, it's going to be a little bit pricey because it actually is now out of print. Um, the actual Sphere... But the same set was re-released in like a box thing. So, but this Phantasm Sphere is really cool. And I'll actually get that out a little bit later in one of my next reviews and show that. But uh, Phantasm 2 uh, takes place nine years after the original. Mike is now in a psychiatric home due to the events of the first one. As you know, uh, people are under the impression that he made this up. It was all in his head, you know, and he's crazy. So, you know, after nine years of solid treatment, he, you know, convinced the doctors that, you know, yeah, it was all make-believe and it wasn't true and stuff like that, you know, in order to get out. Because he actually has to track down this girl, Liz, who is also, who has psychic like him and, you know, has experienced the tall man as well. So now Mike has to get out and go help her. So Mike, you know, meets up with Reggie, once again played by Reggie Bannister, and, you know, they... You know, go out on the road to find this girl and find the tall man, once again, played by Angus Scrim. And this movie is a little bit, or, and that's basically the plot in a nutshell. Um, and this is definitely a, a, a step up from the original Phantasm. Um, you know, this is what a lot of fans like to call it, the action horror film. And it's more like Army of Darkness in terms of, you know, it's horror, but it's got a great deal of action in it. And it really does, you know, and it's, pro it's probably my favorite of the franchise one of the reasons is that you know there's a lot of kick-ass action sequences which i'll talk about i mean you got great weapons you got just all around just a whole action movie like feel to the franchise and the movie this is actually the only studio film of the series it was actually uh produced and released by universal studios it was actually a three million dollar budget which was like 10 times the original budget for phantasm um, and it's actually the lowest budget film that Universal did in the 80s. And it definitely shows how a little bit of money can go a long way with a lot of the effects and stuff like that in the movie. Um, un unfortunately, yeah, like I said, it was a studio film. And they actually wanted to recast both Reggie Bannister and uh, A. Michael Baldwin. They did not want them in the movie. Basically, Coscarelli held him out and he could get only one. Uh, at this time, I think Michael Baldwin was on some kind of like religious like, I don't know, Journey or whatever, and, uh, you know, he, he couldn't do the movie or he didn't want to do the movie. I'm not 100% sure what the whole deal behind that was, but he's actually pissed off about it, you know, and he's just like, Phantasm 2 sucks, I'm not in it, blah, 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 this and that, like James Legro who plays Mike sucks, but, you know, he's just very bitter about it, and I'll talk more about that in my review of Phantasm 3 and 4 about A. Michael Baldwin's feelings, you know, and stuff like that towards the, the movies. Um, but they did get Reggie Bannister back. I mean, who else could have played Reggie? And actually, Brad Pitt auditioned for the role of Mike, but didn't get it. The actor that did get it was James Legro, a guy who would go on to appear in several successful independent films. He was also in Point Break, and he's done a lot of TV work, so the guy's definitely a recognizable face in the world of film. Um, and I'll talk more about him in a few minutes. Um, but... The studio also did not want any dream sequences. They needed a love interest for Mike. You know, they, they were very demanding, and Coscarelli often cites his fr frustrations with them in the Phantasmagoria documentary, which is on the Region 2 set. Um, but you can also find it on YouTube. So, you know, but the movie doesn't really suffer that much from being a studio picture. Um, I know there is a work print version circulating that I'm trying to get a hold of just to check it out. It's about 10 minutes longer, and it has some dream sequences and stuff like that. But I heard it wasn't exact; it wasn't the best. But I still want to check it out, you know, as a Phantasm fan. Um, another thing, you know, the once again we got a great atmosphere. You know, once again that that whole is it real, is it not real atmosphere, and that that it's great, and that's present in all the Phantasm films, and that's why they work so well. Also, once again, a great score, you know, from I think the same guys did the music. Yes, uh, Fred Myro did the music uh, for 
Yes, he did the music for the first one along with Malcolm Seagrave, and he actually has passed away. He passed away in between three and four. Uh, but he did come back to do the music for this one, and, you know, once again, a great score. You know, all the Phantasm movies have great soundtracks, you know, in my opinion. Um, you know, another thing, like I said, there's a $3 million budget, but the special effects are great. This time we have three spheres instead of one, including a gold sphere, which is really cool. It can, like, go through doors and shoot lasers. It's really awesome. And it actually, there's a really cool sequence, which I'll talk about in a little bit, where the gold sphere gets used. Um, another thing that I really enjoy is the, you know, the love story. The love story is perfect. You know, you got Liz and Mike, and there's this whole little love story underlining everything. And it's just right. It's not too much, and it's not too little. It's just, it's right there. It's perfect, and that's why it works. Um, another thing, you got to pay attention, because there's little references in the film. There's a gravestone that says Alex Murphy, reference to RoboCop. Uh, in the morgue, there's a toe tag that says Sam Raimi. And then there's ashes that say Ash J. Campbell. And also, uh, Sam Raimi and Don Coscarelli are friends, and Sam Raimi actually visited the set a number of times. And Sam Raimi would pay tribute to Coscarelli and Phantasm and Darkman. So, you know, they play back and forth. That's the thing you always hear about horror directors. You know, they're not competing with each other. You know, like, well, Michael Myers is better than him, and this guy's better, you know, they're all friends, and that's awesome, that's really cool that, you know, they're, because they're movie fans, you know, they, you know they're, 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 they're just really cool that they're friends and stuff like that. Um, you know, once again, we've got, uh, you know, in terms of characters, we got Reggie, who comes back, and Reggie plays more of a prominent role in this one, you know, he's the action hero, and we got some great sequences with Reggie, which I'll talk about. Um, and like I said, James Legro takes over for the role of Mike. And I loved, he, he's great in this movie, you know, and Coscarelli and Angus Scrimm and Reggie Bannister, they all speak very highly of him. They said he had a good time and, you know, he just, they had a lot of fun working with him. It was good to work with. So that was really cool to hear. And A. Michael Baldwin's still a jerk about it. It's like, dude, it's like over 20 years ago. Let it go. And shit happens. Um, you know, and uh, we actually have... The girlfriend character, Liz, played by Paula Irvin, who's a beautiful actress. And I really like her character. You know, I like her, uh, you know, what she does in the movie. You know, she does a good job. So, you know, I like her. Um, I can't remember her name. But the girl that plays Alchemy, I can't remember her her name. Uh, Samantha? Samantha's? Sa Samantha's her first name. But she's good. Another beautiful actress. You get to see her tits. So, I mean, what's not to love? If you're not going to watch the movie for the spheres, watch the movie for the tits. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> but she does a good job, you know. Samantha Phillips is her name. That's right. Sorry. But she does a good job. You know, I like her. And once again, Angus Scrim back as the tall man. What can be said that hasn't been said before? You know, boy! You think that when you die, you go to heaven? You come to us. Come on. It's the tall man. You don't fuck with the tall man. He's so creepy, man. Not even playing. But anyway, you know, and then we have uh, Kenneth Tiger, I think. he T Tiger, Tiger. Uh, he plays the priest, and the priest, the priest, uh, he knows what's going on, you know, and he's kind of like, you know, I'm, I shouldn't let this go on and stuff like that. So the priest is a pretty cool character, small character, you know. He knows what's really going on. You know, he ain't stupid. Um, you know, in terms of well, I guess I can get down to that. In terms of my favorite scenes, you know, we have the great introduction where we're introduced to Liz and she's talking about how she's been having these visions of the tall man and stuff like that. And we, we actually have a flashback to the first film where we see what happens where the tall man tries to capture Mike and Reggie saves the day with a baseball bat and he blows the house up because it's infested with the dwarf creatures and him and Mike escape safely. Um, and then we also have the sequence where Mike gets out of the psychiatric hospital um, you know, he's digging up graves, and Reggie finds him, and the tall man communicates with him, and then Reggie's house blows up, you know, killing his family, which sets up for the picture, um, you know, that they start to go on the road, and Coscarelli also said that this is the road movie of the franchise, where the characters just hit the road in search of the tall man, you know, and kicking ass, and you, it has that feel, you know, it has that vibe, and it's great, you know, it's a really great vibe. Oh, excuse me again, what the fucking yawning? And then we have the the sequence in the hardware store where they gather the weapons. And, 
you know, it's just a great moment where Reggie picks up one double barrel shotgun, picks up two double barrel shotguns, and he makes a quad barrel shotgun. How fucking cool is that? One of the most iconic traits of the Phantasm franchise, the sawed off four barrel shotgun. Come on, they need, come on, uh, NECA or, well, Movie Maniacs isn't right, NECA. Make a figure of Reggie with the four-barreled shotgun, please. We'll buy it. All of us will buy it, okay? Make it. <laughs> Come on. Just an awesome sequence. And then Mike makes his really kick-ass flamethrower. Just great weapons in this movie. Then we have a sequence where they're they're in a... They go to this mortuary where they find... Um, well, Mike sees this dead body, this naked chick who is uh, Cammy, And he looks, and he looks away... And then he looks back, and she's not there. Dun, dun, dun! And then we have the sequence where, you know, they find Liz, and then the tall man creature pops out of her back. You play a good game, boy. Come east if you dare. And then they just get the fuck back! You know, and Reggie burns it. You know, a little trap sequence, which is pretty cool. And then we have the sequence where uh, Liz, or her grandfather, passes away, which she explains in the beginning of the movie. She's like, everything will come true. Once my grandfather passed away, and he passed away, so we, you know, we see the funeral, and she's walking around the mausoleum, and in a nod to the original, she sees the dwarf creature, and the tall man finds her. Great sign service is about to begin. And then she stabs. She's like has this hair, like tie or like a bobby pin, I guess. She stabs him in the hand, and he lifts it up, and he like licks his yellow blood. It's like it's creepy, man. It's it's really creepy. And then the scene in the priest's home. Where, like, he's drinking. Because, actually, he sees... Well, he goes up to the casket at the end of the funeral. To the to the grandfather. And he stabs it. He's like, God, forgive me. I've let this sacrilege go on far enough. So he stabs the grandfather. And the grandmother sees it and passes out. And then we have a sequence at his home where he's, like, hearing this tapping on the door. And he's sitting there drinking. He's like, damn this one. And he opens the door. And it's the grandfather. It's like, holy shit! You know? But it, it's a cool sequence. And then... The scene where uh, the grandmother's in bed and she gets up and then she lays back down and she turns over and the grandfather returns. And it's like, oh my God, you know, it's, it's pretty creepy. And then, you know, once again, in a nod to the original, um, we have the sequence where, you know, Liz, you know, like Mike is walking around the mausoleum and she runs into, or well, actually, you know, yeah. She's just searching around the mausoleum and sees some of the lurkers and stuff like that. The lurkers are like the, uh, well, the lurkers for, for the fans are the dwarfs. The fans call them lurkers, and the sentinel is what the fans call the spears. So, you know, and they actually mentioned that in Phantasm 3. That's the first one where they mentioned that because the fans had coined the terms for them. So that's a, you know, little trivia to know. But also, the priest is walking around. Sorry, the priest is walking around the mausoleum as well, and, you know, he's like, we've got to get out of here, we've got to warn people, and the tall man uh, grabs him, and he, he's wearing a, a rosary, and he wraps it around him and sticks it up, and the, he delivers the best line in the film, you think that when you die, you go to heaven, you come to us, you know, it's just a great line, and then, you know, the priest does die, we have this sphere, and it has like this like triangular blade on it and it chops his ear off and he's like ah and then it comes back and drills him in the head unfortunately the MPAA did not let this sphere sequence go untouched so they did edit it and the work print version is actually longer and i think it's uncut here on uh youtube i think there is a a video of that the uncut uh death scene so check that out i think it's still on here and then we also have uh, the lurker, grand, the grandma lurker. We find out the tall man made the grandma um, a lurker, and Liz knocks it out. Sorry, grandma. And then we have uh, Reggie and Mike rescue her, and then um, they go back to the house where we have the. Well, actually, there's a dream sequence where Mike sees Cammy, the chick from the the mortuary, and then they actually end up picking her up. And then Reggie's like, "Well, you know, we've been on the road a long time. You know, a guy could use some company and." and Mike's like, you know, this chick was in my dream, and, you know, it's not safe, and, you know. And then, it's actually very funny. We have a sex scene, and a, a running gag in the Phantasm films is Reggie's trying to get lucky, and he doesn't. So in this one, you know, they're getting it on, and she's like, oh, Reg, you have such a nice head. Like, she's, like, kissing his head and, like, punching him in the head. And then, 
that trap goes off because I set these traps up, and then Reg and Mike, you know, run downstairs. Oh, Reg, who are we kidding? I'm a 19 year old kid, and you're a bald, middle aged ex ice cream vendor, <laughs> you know. Then we get into the finale of the film where Liz is captured by the tall man, and Mike and Reggie gear up and go after him, have a cool little chase sequence where the freaking Hemi Cuda crashes and explodes. I cried for four hours, okay? <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Joe Brown, big reference. But then, you know, they get out of the car. Come on, Mike. Let's go kick some ass. So, you know, they go into the mausoleum. And uh, they're trying to get, you know, kill Liz. So, you know, we have this great sequence where, um, you know, Reggie fights in the basement with one of the lurker creatures with a chainsaw. Like, you know, Reggie has this little chainsaw. Come on, you mother! And then the lurker pulls out this big, a or the, the, the graver, grave robber pulls out this big ass chainsaw and they have this great chainsaw fight and then Reg just runs it up through his crotch and like all this blood pours out and he dies and then the little lurkers come out there's four of them so he blasts them away with this quad barrel shotgun then we have a great sequence like I said with the gold sphere um actually you know uh Mike rescues Liz and I know I'm going back and forth but um the sphere the main sphere comes out and pins the uh the mortician's hand to the wall so he chops his hand off, and then the gold sphere comes at him, and it actually follows Mike and Liz, and it's going through doors, and it comes in, and it's searching, and it's got like this laser, and it's searching. It's great. And then um, the mortician comes back, and it actually goes in his back, and then comes up through his throat and into his, his mouth, and it comes out of his mouth. And it's just a great kick-ass sequence. I'm surprised they didn't edit that, you know, but it's just a great sequence to see. And then they actually go to the space gate and the tall man shows up and they uh you know they they start bur or they stick this embalming needle in him and they pump the embalming fluid in him and he's like melting and like this uh they they you know oh, damn it I, I missed something um they because the in order to get to the space gate room they have the sphere so they the sphere that went in the guy's hand they took it out and they put it in the the door so then mike's like hey he pulls it out he's like suck on this and he throws it and it goes into the tall man's head and yellow blood starts shooting out because his blood's yellow and then he just takes it and crushes it and then there's this hole and this little like uh hand comes out and it starts going after mike and then liz sticks this embalming needle in him and then turns on the fluid and it starts like melting the tall man and his eyes explode and he starts melting they did edit that sequence a little bit which is uncut in the work print version and then, you know, they start burning the place down, and Cammy shows up with a hearse, and they check the coffin, there's no dead body, and then her, and Reggie's like, you know, baby, you could have left, and then she starts peeling back her skin, and this, you know, you see that she's, she's the tall man, and Reggie's freaking out, and Reggie gets out of the car, and then Liz and Mike are like, it's only a dream, we're going to wake up, and then the thing comes down, and the tall man's like, no, it's not, and then they get pulled through the glass, and the movie ends. And that's basically Phantasm 2. You know, like I said, the, the action horror sequel. You know, it's got a lot of great action sequences. Reggie Bannister actually did all of his stunts, except the one where he jumps over the chainsaw. Universal would not let him do that stunt. Um, there's also uh, behind-the-scenes footage, which has been circulating for quite some time. I think it's still up here on YouTube, but it's been on horror movie bootleg sites. I want to try and track that down because I've seen some of it, and it is pretty cool. And like I said, you know, I have the VHS and I have the Phantasm Sphere. I actually refuse to buy the Region 1 DVD. Um, it is in widescreen, so I mean, it's not that bad. But Universal sold the rights to Phantasm 3, which they also own, to Anchor Bay very easily. And we got a good DVD. They would not sell the, it, the U.S. rights for Phantasm 2 for some reason. Because Anchor Bay owns the international rights. For some reason, they would not give it up, and it was actually a huge court battle, I heard. Coscarelli had to go to court about it, and they finally released it on DVD with no extra features. Fuck you, Universal. They could have easily sent it to Anchor Bay, and we could have got all the features from the Phantasm Sphere over here. But that's why I bought the Phantasm Sphere, because I wanted Phantasm 2, and I got the extra features. So, and I don't mind having it on VHS. I'm trying to get them all on VHS, and Laserdisc for that matter, because I just got a Laserdisc player. You know, these are the kind of movies I want on Laserdisc, like the films that I really enjoy, like the horror flicks and horror action movies and stuff like that. But I refuse to buy the Region 1 release based solely on the fact that Universal's a bunch of pricks 
and didn't want to give up the rights because they knew that we would automatic. We they knew we would buy it. So like, okay, we'll just release a bare bones and make a shitload of money. So fuck you, Universal. Goddamn cunts. <laughs> anyway, so that's Phantasm 2, probably my favorite uh, fran or film in the franchise. Action horror, got a little bit of comedy in there. And just overall, a great solid sequel. It took us nine years, but we waited and we got it. So uh, thanks for watching, and take care, and uh, stay tuned, because next I'm going to review Phantasm 3, Lord of the Dead. Peace.